All right, good evening. Good evening, good evening. Hope you're doing well. This is Pastor Rocket. Welcome to our uh, second session of, uh, well, Sunday night at my dinner table. <laughs> We're hanging out here in my in my dining room again tonight. We're going to do a little bit of Bible study together. I'm going to sit here and uh, ramble for just a moment, um, see who of you uh, pops in. I'm going to watch the comments for a minute and... Um, Anybody says anything, I will try and comment back. I'll give you a moment or two for that. So it's good to see you. Um, I got a lot of good responses last week to um, just sitting here at the table and doing a really laid back Bible study. Had one uh, particular, or one friend of mine who says, man, you were just so chill. I'm not used to that. I'm used to seeing you preach and you're very enthusiastic. And I said, well, yeah, that's, that's preaching. That's not teaching. And that's not just uh, hanging out and talking about the Bible with people. So and in, in addition to him telling me himself that um, things were, or he was enjoying what was happening there, uh, I had several other people say that they enjoyed just the informal nature of sitting down here at the table. So uh, while my wife is still recovering uh, from her bout with COVID and her time in the hospital, and I'm trying to be near her and um, available to her, I've scaled back uh, our church schedule slightly, so just Sunday nights we'll continue to do here online as long as all of you are still uh, interested uh, in me doing this. Well, we'll be doing it through the end of the month anyway, and then after that we'll just see how that goes, but I did enjoy this last week, so I've got a couple of people showing up here. Good to see you. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm going to give this another minute or two, and then we'll get into um, a little bit of Bible study for those of you that are very observant, yes, I'm drinking tea tonight. That's why the little uh, bag over here on the side um, didn't see a point in brewing a whole pot of coffee this late just for me. And we made it through all the coffee that we made behind me earlier. So <laughs> we're just going to drink tea tonight. All right, two minutes of me rambling is long enough. Hopefully you can hear me well. I don't see any complaints. We've got a few of us here, so I'm just going to begin. Uh, you, If you were in service with us this morning, uh, you've already heard a little bit about what I'm going to talk about this evening. In fact, I squeezed part of it into this morning's message, talking about God being the same yesterday, today, um, and forever, and why that's important. And this morning we tied, uh, with the message I was preaching, we tied the Old Testament and New Testament together uh, with some passages from Isaiah and uh, a couple of other things. We're going to look a little bit more deeply at that tonight. Hmm. Pardon me and thank you, but before we do, let's uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, if you'll join me. Father, I thank you this evening for the chance to sit down with your people and to spend some time with them. I thank you for the, the, the message, the study, the observations you've prepared for us. I pray that I'll speak them well and that your people will receive them and put them into practice and that your purpose will be accomplished because of our time here tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to look at just a couple of uh, couple of scriptures this evening centered around this idea of God does not change. Um, just a quick review right now of what we looked at in service this morning. I ran very, very swiftly through three scriptures that tie the Old Testament to the New. We started in the New Testament and I made the statement that Jesus does not change. Hebrews 13, 8 says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we understand Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he does not change. We also looked at the first uh, first verses of the Gospel of John, which we've studied more in depth on Wednesday evenings. Uh, if you go back and look at that series, it's a fairly long series we've been in. We're going to take a break from it for a little bit, but... For about the last 19, 20 weeks, we've been looking at the Gospel of John. But John begins his Gospel and the New Testament there, um, or his entry in the New Testament begins with the statement that Jesus has always been with God since the beginning. Uh, oops, pardon me, forgot to mute my phone. Now it's off. <laughs> uh, John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And we know those when it says word, that's a capital W. I've already done the study explaining and showing, and if you've been in church for any period of time or studied the word yourself, you're probably aware that John is referencing Jesus and calling him the word and the fulfillment of the word of God. So he's been there since the beginning. With that statement, John is bringing forward from the Old Testament, um, or bringing forward into the New Testament this concept from the Old Testament that God has been around 
uh, for a long time. He formed and created everything. Genesis 1, verses 1, two th 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. God said, let there be light, and there was light. So Jesus has never changed. He has been with God since the beginning. God created everything. So we have this, this lineage of Jesus being with God and God in his purpose and his nature and his intent since the creation of the world toward mankind and for us has not changed. Scripture establishes that Jesus was there in the beginning. Jesus is one with God. And Jesus is the means of bringing the nature and the will of God to us in the New Testament. And the statement that I made this morning uh, in going through this was that if we don't believe that the Old Testament establishes the baseline for the nature of God, we're missing out on the full benefit or the full understanding of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We're missing out on what it means to be a Christian now. And sometimes I use the word disciple. Oftentimes I prefer that terminology over Christian simply because Christian has almost become like a brand name that uh, encompasses a lot of things that may or may not even have anything to do with actually having a relationship with Christ and following after him and seeking to honor and please him with my life and, and do his work. So I frequently use the word disciple and talk a lot about discipleship as far as uh, being disciplined in what scripture teaches and how we should behave. Uh, and I use that as a means of, I'm not trying to, to, to just poke a bear or stir things up. Personally, that resonates better with me as far as reflecting Christ and my relationship with him rather than that that bigger picture of Christian that so many things are lumped into and raises often more questions than gives answers. So we're missing out on something if we don't realize that that same God of the Old Testament is still present in the New Testament and has not changed. And I want to look at what that means a little bit more in depth tonight, and I want to do it by looking at two stories. Um, Two stories, one in the Old, one in the New Testament, that have some very similar principles and concepts and ideas that I think will help us under this, understand this idea of God not changing. The first reference, um, you'll see it there in the title of this, this video, uh, if you haven't watched it all, or have, if looked over in the sidebar or whatever there, Genesis 4, verses 1 through 15. I want to read these with you and look at this story. It's likely a familiar one to you. Um, the story of Cain and Abel and the offerings that they brought before the Lord. I'll just begin reading in verse 1 here of chapter 4. Adam was intimate with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. She said, I have had a male child with the Lord's help. Then she also gave birth to his brother Abel. Abel became a shepherd of flocks, but Cain worked the ground. In the course of time, Cain presented some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord, and Abel also presented an offering, some of the firstborn of his flocks and their fat portions. For the sake of this, take note of that. Cain brought some of the produce. Abel brought the first of what his flock produced. The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. Cain was furious and looked despondent. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you furious and why do you look despondent? If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you but you must rule over it. Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out into the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, Cain replied. Am I my brother's guardian? Some translations say my brother's keeper. Then he said, what have you done? You're, then he, capital H, the Lord, says, what have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you're cursed, alienated from the ground that opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood that you've shed. If you work the ground, it will never again give you its yield. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. But Cain answered the Lord and said, My punishment is too great for me to bear. Since you're banishing me today from the soil, I must hide myself from your presence and become a restless wanderer upon the earth. Whoever finds me will kill me. And the Lord replied to him, In that case, whomever kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. And he placed a mark on Cain so that whoever found him would not kill him. So this is a story that you're likely familiar with. You've probably heard before if you've been to Sunday school, if you've listened to a minister preach, if you've read scripture yourself, it's likely one of the ones that you, you know. 
Cain brings an offering before the Lord of just some of what he harvested from the ground. It does not say it was the first. It does not say it was the best. It does not say it was anything special. It just says some of what he got, he brought before the Lord. Abel brought an offering before the Lord that was the first and the best of what he got from his work. And they bring those things to the Lord. And Cain's we, we, we look at this and we go, okay, I know we're going to get to the part where Cain kills his brother and that's a problem. But for the sake of this conversation, until we get there, let's go through a little at a time. Cain's initial sin, what started the problem, what began the conversation with God, and what got him angry was that God approved of his brother's offering and not his. And Cain's initial sin was one of dishonesty. We spoke about this a bit last week. He made a show of bringing his best before the Lord for an offering, when in fact what he brought was not the first and the best. It was just some of. It was a portion of. It was a bit. It may have even been part of the best. You'd have to study a little deeper, and that's not the point tonight. It says he brought some of, but he presented it as if it was worthy of the Most High God and was a suitable and appropriate offering before the Lord. His dishonesty was in saying, I'm presenting to you what you deserve, but the Lord knew better and saw the truth. Cain actually kept something for himself that he should have been giving and pouring out. And then he brought the leftovers or the remnants or the seconds or even just a portion of the best to God as an offering without bringing it all. The thing that's interesting about this to me is the produce that Cain brought before the Lord was his to begin with. It was the ground he was working. It was the work that he was doing. It, was, it belonged to him to do with as he saw fit. God did not look at him and say, you have to bring me an offering today. He did not demand something of him in this moment. It just says Cain of his own free will brought an offering before the Lord, and what he brought was unsuitable. God didn't ask for a specific thing in this instance. Cain just decided, I'm going to bring these things to the Lord, but there's a couple of issues with it. I've already said this once. What he brought was not appropriate because God deserves our best. We should always bring our best and our wholeness. We've talked about that word holiness before, how it comes from the same root word as whole, W-H-O-L-E, being complete. We should bring everything and the best of it before the Lord. And we talked last week both on Sunday morning and Sunday night, um, about even if our best is not great, the best that I have in my position right now, it might be my brokenness, it might be my hurt, it might be that I'm angry, it may be that I am sick, but it's the best I'm able to bring before the Lord because He is God. So even if it's my brokenness, or if it happens to be my greatest accomplishment, or the greatest fruit, or the greatest result of my labor, our best is honestly, when we look at it from God's perspective, it's not that much better than our worst when we compare it to how great he is anyway. We know the verse about my righteousness is filthy rags. It's not a question of whether I'm bringing the best thing before the Lord because there's that much difference between my best and my worst, but there's a big difference in my heart between my desire to bring him my best and my everything. And there's a big difference in my intention if I'm bringing him leftovers or if I'm bringing him the best I've got. We have to ask ourselves when we bring an offering before the Lord, am I bringing it to him honestly and sincerely because I know who he is and I know what he requires? Have I done my best to honor him because I recognize and respect who he is because he's God? What came brought was inappropriate. Now that's, that's the bigger issue really there. It's not just that it was inappropriate, but it was that Cain was not honoring the Lord. Cain was misrepresenting what he brought before God, and in turn, he was displaying that he didn't have a grasp on who and what God was. God calls him out on this in verses 6 and 7. I'm going to paraphrase here, but God basically says, You know what's right, and if you'll do what's right, I'll accept it. And if you're not doing what's right, you're inviting sin into your life rather than welcoming me. It's a correction from the Lord, and it's not an easy one, because Cain did put some labor and some effort into what he brought. But there was a heart issue, there was an honesty issue, and there was a recognition and an honoring of God issue at the center of this. So Cain, rather than accepting correction, and we're terrible about this, about this as people. We don't like to be corrected by the pastor, by our spouse, by, some, by my boss. I don't necessarily like someone to come and tell me, you haven't done this well. 
no matter how gently or politely or kindly they do it. And oftentimes, when we know we've done something wrong, we're even less willing to be corrected or discipled in something because we already have an issue in our heart that's being called out. If I've done the right thing with the right attitude, I'm much more willing to accept correction in many cases because my intent is to do the best and I can say, yes, Lord, yes, honey, yes, sir. My intent was not to do poorly and I will do better next time. But if I've come thinking I'm going to pull one over on somebody, then there's already a problem with me. I get called out on it. I'm more likely to get embarrassed or get angry or become rebellious about it. And that's exactly what Cain does here. Rather than accepting the correction because in his heart, God's already said, you know what's right. And Cain did. Or at least he should have. And so he doubles down on his sin. He gets angry. He decides to invite that sin into his life that God says, it's crouching at the door if you've done this wrong. And he murders his brother. Now at this point, whether you feel like Cain might have been able to make an excuse and slide by with a substandard offering, and perhaps there's a, a perfectly good reason, and we have to take people's circumstances into account, no matter what you may have thought about the offering situation, at this point, Cain has killed someone and become openly angry at God. Now we have a bigger problem. When we look at the God of the Old Testament, we typically think of that God as being a God of justice. He's the one that, when, when I use um, analogies to talk about the Lord in my own messages and sermons, I, I oftentimes like to pull that dramatic thing about this. This is the God who says, you know, go into that town because they've offended me and destroy their army, kill all the men, depose their king, now kill the women, now kill the children, now set the town on fire, now kill the livestock, now plow the ashes and the bones into the ground so nothing will grow and then when people drive by that barren spot of land they'll know what happens to the people that oppose the Lord your God obviously I'm paraphrasing but if you go look at the the nature of the way God had his army treat the armies that opposed him it was very akin to what I just described it was violent because the Lord was jealous and he wanted justice for wrongdoing we think of that as the Old Testament God I must have justice for a wrongdoing if we look at the Old Testament in that way, and we look at that God in that way, and we look at things like, I realize the Ten Commandments have not shown up in Scripture yet, but if we were to apply those principles, because God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, the things that he's expressing there that he's displeased with should apply even in the case of Cain. So Cain deserves to die. That's justice. He's lied to God. He has held on to his anger, even though he's been rebuked for it, and he has continued to sin deliberately, and now he's murdered someone. Old Testament justice says, kill him, he's a lost cause, and God doesn't tolerate sin. But instead, we see a very curious thing in the story of Cain. There's definitely a punishment that comes upon him. But then we see God demonstrate something we don't often attribute to the Old Testament God. We see something that looks like grace. We see at the end of that story, if you go back and look at verse 15, the Lord replied to him, in that case, whoever kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over, and he placed a mark on Cain so that whoever found him would not kill him. He spared Cain's life. Cain said, my punishment is too great to bear. When I think about my own sin and I think about a modern timeline and I think about a post-resurrection or post-crucifixion and resurrection Jesus and relationship I have with God, it sounds a whole lot like grace that God would extend something to a human being because the punishment that they deserved was too great to bear and he would instead spare their life. This is what he does with Cain, despite what Cain obviously deserves. It's very interesting that we see a demonstration that looks so much like grace in the Old Testament when we would normally associate it with the New. But you have to remember, tonight we're talking about God is the same and has not changed from day one to today. We see, if we look at this passage, that grace was part of God's nature even in the beginning, even before Jesus. It may have not been the defining characteristic, but it was still a part of his character and nature all the way back as early as Genesis. Now, how in the world is this possible? Well, I think I've answered that for you already. The nature of God in the Old Testament is still the nature of God in the New Testament, but the covenant and the relationship we have, the vehicle we have by which we get to his presence has become different. In order to illustrate, though, 
how things are the same from the Old Testament to the New, I want to look at another story really briefly here. The second story you'll find in Acts chapter 5. It's the first 11 verses. Another one that you're likely familiar with. Funny story for you. Um, one of my children, as they were growing up, went through a spell where they, uh, they, would, they liked to lie. I don't know why. I don't know where they got it from. Um, but they, they, they would lie about just about anything. Even things that were pointless that it didn't seem to make sense for them to lie about, they would lie. And we needed to do something. And so I had my child uh, one day while I was at work and they were at home. I had them read this story and write it out long form by hand and then have a discussion with me about it when I got home. And... Uh, they read this story that we're about to read now, and I, I, I asked them when I got home, what did you learn about how God feels about liars? And they said, God doesn't like liars. <laughs> I said, you're absolutely right. And the child looked back at me and said, God hates liars so much that he kills them. <laughs> and I said, well, in the context of this story, you are correct, <laughs> but perhaps we need to adjust <laughs> the perspective because I don't, uh, I think maybe I have gone a bit overboard. But the child stopped lying after that, and now is one of my children that I can look at and say, no matter what else might be going on in their life, they're completely honest with me. But just a funny personal story there for you. But let's read this story out of Acts about Ananias and Sapphira in a situation that is going to sound shockingly similar to the first story we read. Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. A man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. However, he kept back part of the proceeds with his wife's knowledge and brought a portion of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds from the field? Wasn't it yours while you possessed it? After it was sold, wasn't it at your disposal? Why is it that you planned this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. When he heard these words, Ananias dropped dead and a fear came over all who heard. The men got up, wrapped his body, and carried him out and buried him. There was an interval of about three hours, and then his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and said, Tell me, or and Peter said, Tell me, did you sell the field for this price? Yes, she said, for this price. Then Peter said to her, Why did you agree to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. And instantly she dropped dead at his feet. When the young men came in, they found her dead carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Then great fear came on the whole church and on all those who heard these things. Now this story has some similarities to the one that we just read about Cain and Abel. A little bit of backstory, if you go back one chapter in Acts, you see that all the Christians were coming together and they were selling their belongings, selling their property, and they were beginning to use it to develop a community that was focused on caring for the poor and sustaining the gospel by making sure those who were in need were cared for, and that was opening doors for them to begin to expand the gospel and talk to other people about what was going on with Jesus and his message now that he had been crucified, resurrected, and left. The apostles, the disciples, and this community were all working to take care of one another and take care of those in need. Ananias and Sapphira decided to participate in this, but they didn't decide to do so honestly. They sold a piece of land, and they appeared to be doing the same things that the community was doing. However, they decided that they were not going to hand over all of the money the way that uh, so many others had in the community, but they wanted the appearance of doing what everyone else was doing. So in this respect, the couple sins in very much the same way that we look at the situation from Cain and Abel. They misrepresented what they were bringing before the Lord. They were not required or called to bring any certain kind of offering. That happened to be what the community was doing, but that's not necessarily what they were told to do. Even Peter points this out and calls them out on it in verse 4. He says, wasn't it yours while you possessed it? The land belonged to you. You could have done whatever you wanted. And after it was sold, wasn't it at your disposal? That money belonged to you, and you could have done whatever you wanted with that money. The Lord did not demand it of you. And he says, so why is it that you planned this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Why, when it belongs to you to do what you wanted with, and when you sold it, the money was yours to do what you wanted, why would you come misrepresent yourself to God and say, I'm bringing all of this before the Lord, when in fact you weren't? The sin was the lie about what they brought. But we look at God's response to this. We, we see the way he responded to Cain. Cain 
was disciplined and corrected by the Lord and Cain doubled down on his sin and went and made the problem worse and God extended grace, God's response in this situation is very different. This New Testament God that we often as modern Christians look at and say this is the God of grace, this is the God of loving and embracing and taking care of and, and giving forgiveness freely to anybody that comes before him that's made a mistake. This New Testament God under the New Covenant, post-crucifixion, resurrection, ascension of Jesus, he responds by killing both the husband and wife for their deception and misrepresentation of him. That sounds a whole lot like a whole lot more like Old Testament justice to me, quite frankly, and probably does to you as well. How can that be? The same reason that we see grace in the Old Testament is the reason that we see God take justice on this couple in the New Testament. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus has been with him from the beginning. Jesus was God and his nature and his intention brought forward into the New Testament. There is no change. God has always wanted a relationship with his people. God was willing to extend grace in the Old Testament. God still wants justice in the New Testament. That line down the middle does not divide God into two completely different kinds of people. The New Testament, mes New Testament message of grace does not change who God is, nor does it change his level of tolerance for things like sin. The Old Testament tells us about the heart of God for people and also of his nature as God, and that extends across the line into the New Testament. The truth is God does not, cannot, will not tolerate sin. The sacrifice of Jesus demonstrates the depth and the breadth of God's desire and determination to reconcile with us and to have a relationship with us as human beings, but the fact that he's made a way to reconcile and a way that's better than the law of the Old Testament, that's more sufficient for it, it still doesn't change God's nature. I used this verse this morning. I'm going to use it again tonight. Matthew 5, verses 17 through 18, read like this. Jesus is speaking, and he says, Don't assume that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. I assure you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or single stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all things are accomplished. Jesus was the fulfillment of the law. The wages of sin is still death. The difference in the New Testament is, will we accept the death of Jesus as the price and then begin to live as if we have been bought by that price? Or will we continue to live the way we want to live until such time as our death is the price? The cost is still the same. God's nature and opinion on sin is still the same. Jesus fulfilled the law in that way if we will accept him and allow him. Jesus is the only way that we will be redeemed from our sin. The nature of God remains and the law of God still remains. Now, you may be asking yourself, because I ask myself the same thing, why did Cain experience grace while Ananias and Sapphira experienced justice? My honest answer to that is I don't know. And there may be someone who can give you a better answer than that, but my answer for you tonight in the context of this conversation is this. I'm not meant to understand everything. And neither are you, and neither is any human being. Anyone that tells you that they have all the answers is a liar. Because God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, Isaiah 55, um, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. Um, I'll read the whole verse since I've already started. You know, this is the Lord's declaration. For as heaven is higher than earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Sometimes, because I said so, is dad's answer. And I may or I may not understand later, and whether I do or I don't is irrelevant. Am I obedient and submitted to it? I don't have an answer why God chose grace for Cain and why God chose justice for Ananias and Sapphira. I can tell you that there may come a time that I can understand that, and you can understand that. There may come a time when I can look at the things of the Lord and I can understand much more than I do now. Um, just to give you a couple of references, I made myself some notes here. Paul speaks in Second Corinthians uh, verses one through five, or Second Corinthians uh, one through five of a new and heavenly body, and hopefully that body comes with a new mind that's able to understand and see things more like Christ than the one I have now does. 
Uh, Paul speaks in Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse 23, about the renewing of our mind, even while we're here on earth as we grow closer to Christ and continue to pursue him. And there will be a time, even in my natural life, when I understand the Lord better than I used to, but I will still never completely comprehend him. And then if you just read the New Testament as a whole, you see all kinds of places where the Spirit of God reveals things to man in his time, in his planning, as it is his will to do so. But the truth is, I may never understand everything God does and why he does it. What I do need to understand is what is the nature of and heart of God for me. And it is unified throughout Scripture. He has a heart and a desire to be Father to me. His nature is Father. We did a study on this not too terribly long ago. Um, he desires more than anything to be in a relationship with me. And when he saw that the law was not sufficient because I couldn't keep all those rules, he provided another price to be paid, another way that the debt would be paid, that the law would be satisfied. And that was the mission of Jesus. And that was accomplished uh, and made available. But whether that's in practice in my life is up to me, whether I accept it and whether I submit to it. Do I want to roll the dice on whether God decides to have grace or justice where I'm concerned? Personally, no, I don't. Um, and I hope you wouldn't either. I would like to think that you would trust him. And I would like through conversation and through reading and through prayer and through time with the Lord, I would like you to arrive at a place where you would say, I don't want to take a chance um, on the fact that God will just have blanket grace for everything and that I will not be a person who ends up experiencing justice as a result of my decisions. Um, but to think that God's distaste for sin has changed just because grace is the more prominent quality that we attribute to him in the age in which we live, it's, a, it's, it's simply an unwise decision. It's not a, an accurate way to portray the Lord because the Lord is the same. Um, if we want to go back and look at this, I mean, I could speculate a little bit. I did make a couple of notes just for the sake of, uh, of conversation this evening. You know, Cain's initial sin, um, Cain's initial sin was against God alone. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira sinned against God, but they also lied to God's people in a way that um, it was obvious that they were not being honest. They were pretending to be something that they were not. And God protects his children. Uh, the sacrifice of Jesus was the ultimate result of God's desire to protect humanity and protect us from the consequences of our own impurity and our own actions. And God doesn't have a whole lot of tolerance for people that deceive his people. Paul writes extensively about this and talks about false teachers that will come. Jesus spends a lot of time, he, he says, I'm sending you out as you know, the disciples, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. He calls the Pharisees a brood of vipers. God doesn't have a whole lot of tolerance for the for the deception of his people. So maybe that's why in this situation he chose justice because he and Cain worked out their issue between the two of them where what Ananias and Sapphira did was a, a sin against God for sure, but also was a, a public misrepresentation of who they were. I don't know that that's the case. That's just personal conjecture. Um, and I'm labeling it as such so you don't take it home as gospel. You may find a better answer than me. Feel free to to, to leave a response here if you have one to that. Um, I can't say that I'll engage in some lengthy discussion with you, but I'd certainly be interested to read what you might have to say. Um, so it, 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 what I've just speculated could be why, or perhaps it's just so that I can see grace and justice from the Old Testament and New Testament across that line. But that's more study than I planned tonight. Tonight, the point that I want to leave you with is this. God has not changed that first verse. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's been with God since the beginning. God's nature has not changed from creation to today. There's not a free pass in this era simply because of grace. Acts 5.11, that last verse that we read out of that story in Acts, it speaks of a fear of God. Um, I've referenced several times a great message that was given in our church a little over three years ago by a gentleman by the name of Mike Nations. Um, who preached and he says sometimes we have cheapened this idea of the fear of God by just calling it respect or reverence when the truth is sometimes you need to have the kind of fear that comes from dad's coming in the room and he's angry and he has some authority to do some things that are unpleasant in order to produce the results that he wants in my life. Sometimes you need that knee knocking fear of I don't want to get disciplined by dad in order to have God in his proper place and perspective. 
Um, Acts 5.11 says there was a fear of God that came over people because they were aware that God took sin seriously still, even though the sacrifice of Jesus had been made. Having an awareness of those consequences that God still hates sin today, just as much as he has loved people from the beginning, would be good for us to remember and would well inform our journey as disciples, even in this era in which we live. That's the extent of the conversation I plan to have with you tonight. I don't see any comments uh, this evening, so I'm going to close in prayer, and I'm going to sign off, and I'm going to wish you a good evening. Father, I thank you tonight for the opportunity to be with your people, the chance to just sit and to teach and to talk. Lord, I pray that those who have watched, who have tuned in, who will even watch this recording later, that this will find a place in their heart. And Lord, that they will filter out what was my words and they'll even forget them and not hear them, but what came from you. And it's helpful and beneficial in their journey toward becoming better disciples, more holy, more sanctified, better suited for your service. Those things would take root in their heart and draw them closer to you. We love you. We're grateful for your time here with us. And we look forward to when you'll meet with us again soon. In your name we pray. Amen. On that note, God bless you. Thank you for joining me. And I will see you again here at the kitchen table next Sunday night.